gentle warning Messiah, warning Yeshua, warning the olive tree, Jew and Gentile, warning Messiah, warning Yeshua. Hello, friends, and welcome again, all Prophecy Fulfilled. So glad that you can join me. We are kicking up a brand new series. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up series, uh, bonus material that I call it, On the Gentiles. I did a Christianity news flash on who are the biblical Gentiles, and here's a hint, it's not you. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a controversial topic, and people are upset, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to put my money where my, my mouth is, and I'm going to demonstrate this through a, a, a series. And uh, so, this is going to be like seven or eight uh, parts. Uh, uh, here's what I need you to do. If you're interested in, in this topic and you really want to hear what I have to say about it, uh, stay with me on this. Uh, I'm going to try to keep these fairly short, 10, 15, 20 minutes long, if I can, probably not this first one. Uh, so we need to take each lesson one at a time. Uh, the first lessons, uh, they're going to be foundational and we're going to build upon these, okay? The latter lessons are going to draw from the beginning one, so it's important to let this develop. Uh, this will come full circle if you allow it. You will see the trajectory of the story uh, from beginning to end, how the, the story of the Gentiles comes to fruition. Whoever the Gentiles are, we're going to find that out. Uh, so let this develop, and usually I'm going to try to have basically one main point for each lesson, uh, one big takeaway, one, something to solidify and remember going forward in the other lesson. So if we can do this together, I think this can be enlightening. So, okay, uh, I don't want to waste any time, so here we go. First, uh, a few minutes of review uh, on my last Christianity News Flash. That's what uh, spurred this, this series. Christians today use the word Gentile. Uh, and really what they mean is that anybody who's not Jewish, right? Anybody who's not of Israel. So the common uh, conception or perception, I guess, is you've got really two types of people in the world. You've got uh, Jews and Gentiles, and it, it's painted with a very generic, broad brush, if you will. Uh, the assumption goes that Gentiles are anybody from anywhere, past, present, or future, and anybody who's not a part of Israel was or is a Gentile. And that last part is actually true. Being outside the covenant body was to be other than Israel. And to be other than Israel was tantamount to being, well, Gentile. And I'm using quotes here because we're going to talk about what Gentile is in the Hebrew and Greek. So um, Jesus came along. Again, this is the common assumption, the common Christian way of thinking. Jesus comes along. He offers the everlasting new covenant to both Jew and Gentile, right? Uh, and voila, that basically means that everybody and anybody from all humanity, the mass of all humanity uh, from that time forward, everybody's invited into this new covenant. Uh, Gentiles like you and like me and anybody else, right? That's, that's, what's the, that's the basic foundational supposition right there. Uh, and I'm telling you right now that no, that is not the case. Not, now hear me out, not if we're going to define things within the contextual confines of the biblical story. And I use that a lot, the contextual confines, and people don't like that. Confines, you mean you're, being, you're, you're restricting this, Ryan? Yes. Some people think that means that I'm, I'm restricting or confining uh, things unnecessarily. But you know what? I actually think this is the responsible approach. Uh, confining meaning to within the literature is a respons responsible thing to do. And I think Christians don't seem to like that. They like to genericize things so much because I think confining things to their, con their context, I think that holds or it postpones the immediate um, application or the apparent immediate relevance 
to, to us, to them. And I think this makes uh, Christians feel uncomfortable, to be honest with you. So let's be clear on the word itself. Again, we use the term Gentile, okay? Uh, and that actually comes from the Hebrew or the Greek uh, goi, goyim, and the Greek ethnos. Now, that is actually a very unfortunate rendering, Gentile, because Gentile actually comes from the Latin uh, gentius or gentilis, and it is just an extremely misleading translation and Gentile is kind of morphed throughout the the centuries really to uh, into something that it didn't in the text and what, what do I mean by, by that well most of us today when we're reading our Bibles we we tend to speak of as an individual as a Gentile he that person was a Gentile that person was a Jew there's a Gentile there's a Gentile right there um, but that's not really accurate because both goi uh, and goyim, goi, and ethnos, those two right there, those are collective nouns. And that's important. So neither goi or goyim or ethnos really should be used to identify a specific individual. Okay? But it's, it's funny because the primary use of goi in ethnos, it's morphed into exactly that. Right. But the Bible always uses these collective nouns or these collective terms to identify various nations or groups that are composed of individuals. And I don't know if you're starting to see the difference here. Um, so a more accurate definition or meaning of goi or ethnos would be something like this. It would be a multitude of individuals. So there's a there's a big mass of individuals from the same category or the same group of people, that group of individuals, that group of people, that group, that group. Perhaps those are the goi, the goyim. And all together, that's the goyim right there. There's a goy, there's a goy, there's a goy, a big group. And then all those are the goyim. So goy, goyim, ethnos, it really just means nation or nations and we would do so well to to rid ourselves of that misleading word gentile just get rid of it all together and start using nation or nations in its place and here's the here's the key here's the catch then if we do that and um, <laughs> we then what we have to do is we then have to allow the context, context, context to determine which nation or which nations or in other words, which particular group of people, uh, which particular multitude of individuals is in view in the text. Let us figure that out. Don't just say Gentile, say nations and let us figure out through the context which nation or nations or group of people is being discussed. Okay, so context must be the referee. So let me kind of give you the big picture context so you can kind of uh, begin to formulate which Gentiles are actually in view in the Bible. So early on, we see promises to Abraham. And we're all, I think, fairly familiar with Abraham, his story, the promises to Abraham. So let me give you just a few of these, like Genesis 15, 5. And the Lord took him outside and said, Now look to the heavens and count the stars, if you are able. Then he declared, so shall your offspring be. Genesis 12, 2, he says to Ab Abraham, or Abram, I will make you a great nation, a great goy. You, Abraham, your descendants are going to be a great nation. Okay, Genesis 18, 18, Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations, goyi, of the earth, or land shall be blessed in him. So you've got Abraham's going to be a, a, a nation, and all the nations around him will be blessed. Okay, uh, Genesis 22, 17, 18, blessed I, Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants at the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore. 
Genesis 26, 4. Now this is actually to Isaac. I will give your descendants, descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations, there's your goyim, of the land or earth shall be blessed. Okay, so without getting ahead of ourselves too much, take note of three things. You got the goyim or the nations, you got the land or the earth, and you've got descendants. So you got those three components right there. And I know it's really, 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 really difficult. But let's not make any premature, premature assumptions about two things. Don't make any assumptions yet about who these goyim are, who these nations are. And don't make any assumptions about what this earth is or what this land in view is. Okay? Let's just kind of let that slide for now. We're going to let the story push ahead, okay? Because we're going to allow Scripture to inform us as we go. And by the way, you know, as far as the, the multitude of descendants, you know, promised, um, you know, to, to Abraham, you know, like dust or sand, you know, these were clearly fulfilled within Israel's history. You know how I know? Because it's in the scriptures. It says right here, uh, 2 Chronicles 1, 9. Now, O Lord God, let your promise to David, my father, be established. For you have made me a king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Well, that sounds like the promise to Abraham. Well, it was. How about Numbers 23.10? This is Balaam speaking. Who can count the dust of Jacob or the number or number one-fourth of Israel? Sounds like there's a sounds like Abraham's descendants Israel or like the dust of the earth or dust of the land. How about 1 Kings 4.20? Judah and Israel became as numerous as sand by the sea. Those are fulfillments, folks. So it's, it's really important to keep in mind uh, who exactly or whom exactly and only these promises and these fulfillments pertain to. These were to Abraham's descendants, and we clearly see these verses, like I just read, uh, ascribing fulfillment to Israel. Israel, as far as the story goes thus far that we've seen uh, as it moves along, Israel was Abraham's seed, uh, according to these verses and, and many others. I'm, you know, off the top of my head, uh, is it Isaiah 49.1 talks about Israel uh, is Abraham's seed. A, uh, Israel was chosen. Israel was the elect. Um, I'll have to put it up on the screen for you. I'm, I'm summarizing. So, Back to the promises of, of Abraham. You know, I can't say it enough. Right here, this is where I think we have been programmed to prematurely look ahead and get ahead of ourselves and say, yeah, this is talking about all nations on, on planet Earth, right? And that's us. That's us today. You know, and we just can't seem to help ourselves. And we do this all the time. We need to resist this temptation. Uh, and and I, I think we do that by disciplining ourselves to not jump ahead, uh, like to the New Testament. D you know, don't assume that we know exactly what goy, what nation, or goyim, what nations are in these verses. Let's, why not just let the story play out a little bit? Let's get some more information. Let's see what develops. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard or I've seen somebody's response to Genesis 26.4 be something like this. This is talking about Abraham's seed and the nations. We, today, America, Australia, Every nation are the nations on planet Earth, and we are blessed. And we know that from the New Testament, that everybody of faith is Abraham's seed. Anybody within the mass of humanity who has faith is Abraham's seed. So that's us too, because we know that from the New Testament, because uh, it says so like in Galatians and in Romans. So we know what he's talking about here in Genesis. And I'm like, wait, 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 slow down. We're going to get to that. But for now, look, we've only really seen one usage of Abraham's seed in the Old Testament. And Abraham's seed is Israel. So for now, just follow along. Follow my train of thought. Don't get ahead of me because this is going to come full circle. And it's going to make sense at the end of the story when we do get there. And, and I know you've read these verses like in Genesis a million times, as have I. Um, 
uh, but let's not assume who these nations, who these goyim are just yet. So with that being said, I want you to take a, th take a look at this particular verse, this particular passage. It's really insightful. Pay attention because this is right in line with the promises made to Abraham. Genesis chapter 48. Now, you probably recall when, when um, Jacob or Israel was getting old and he was going to bless his grandsons. He has Manasseh and Ephraim and he, he kind of does the old change over there, right? Remember that? And so Jacob or Israel prophesied that Ephraim, uh, which by the way, Ephraim, you, you, you got to know this. And you find this out from, from later, you get information within the story. But we know that Ephraim, <clears throat> who was Joseph's boy, but Ephraim later on, the prophets use Ephraim to reference the house of Israel and to identify the 10 northern tribes. That's what, that's what Yahweh, that's what the prophets call the house of Israel. Ephraim. Okay, so here we are in Genesis 48, and Jacob prophesies that Ephraim's descendants would become a multitude of nations. Ephraim himself, his descendants, would become a multitude of nations. Goyim. Now, think about that. Isn't that kind of odd? Israel, the northern kingdom, would actually become a multitude of nations. And how can that be when we already know ahead of time, because we know the story, that the, the northern kingdom, they were going to be destroyed. They were going to be scattered. They were going to be assimilated into the nations. Ah, there's a little hint right there. Into the nations. So follow, follow me with this. Now, here's a question. If Gentile... If that really were the, the proper, correct, more accurate translation, if Gentile were the correct translation, why not just say that Ephraim's descendants would become a multitude of Gentiles? Huh? Why not just say that? Well, you know, actually, it's kind of funny. I did find uh, one particular translation that said that, uh, Jubilee Bible, and his seed shall become a multitude of Gentiles. But you know why we don't see that very often? Because this just doesn't sound right, does it? How can Israel, how can Ephraim become a multitude of Gentiles? Well, that doesn't sound right. Right? That doesn't make sense. And that doesn't make sense to most. And it didn't make sense to the translators. So they would render it nations. That sounds better, right? Because that's a bit more palatable. Something that fits our idea of what we think the nations are. So in this case, virtually all translators render it nation, uh, which I think it should be across the board, like I've said. So, but again, I, 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 I digress a little bit. I ask the question. A multitude of Gentiles. That doesn't really make sense, does it? You know what? It makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense in light of the predicted and prophesied trajectory of Ephraim and Israel's story. From the entire story, from, from beginning to end. This actually happened to Israel, to Ephraim. And we, we will see it uh, develop if we have the patience to let it unfold. We will see how Ephraim actually became a multitude of Gentiles. Yes, Gentiles into the nations. Um, but we need to take note of the story as told by the prophets as the story unfolds. Israel, particularly the northern kingdom, did in fact become Gentile Israelites. They became the Goyim. And it was exactly, it was exactly these Gentiles that we see coming back full circle into the covenant with Yahweh through a new covenant marriage through the gospel in the New Testament. But we have to see it play out. Um, oh, I was, was going to say actually a side note. 
You know, I was thinking about Joseph's story, and we all kind of are familiar with, with the story. He was separated from his brothers, right? Remember that? Sold into slavery. Uh, and he went into the nations, but later on he was basically redeemed, if you will. Um, and then we see Jacob, Israel, saying that Joseph's son, Ephraim, uh, the house of Israel, the, the northern tribes, they would become the Goyim. They would become that. In fact, uh, Genesis 49, Jacob mentions the separation. Remember, uh, Israel is prophesying over the, about the 12 tribes, the sons, right? And he mentions in, in Genesis 49 that uh, uh, Joseph's separation from his brothers and out of Joseph we get Ephraim. And I wonder if the story of Joseph isn't a typological foreshadowing or a reflection of future events for Israel, of Ephraim's story. Their separation from the covenant body, they're being cut off, but not permanently. So that kind of makes me wonder. So, but for now, look, I told you I was going to try to keep these short. This is already longer than I wanted it to be. So, but for now, lesson number one. I just want you, wanted you to take note of the promises to Abraham and how Scripture uh, in the Old Testament, very, very early on actually, confirms the fulfillment of Abraham's literal seed as dust of the earth, stars of heaven, and all that. And, and they, he is, they ascribe that to Israel. Okay, Old Covenant, First Covenant, Israel. And I wanted you to take note of the use of Goy and Goyim, nations, in relation to Abraham. And how Ephraim, right there, that's really what I want you to focus on. How Ephraim himself, Ephraim himself, Israel, was prophesied really to become, or the northern king, the house of Israel, was prophesied to become a multitude of Gentiles, a multitude of nations. And we're going to see exactly how that plays out and how that happens in the next few lessons. And uh, this will become, I think, more and more clear as we get rolling. So that was kind of a, a big introduction, uh, introductory lesson. So uh, we'll get rolling on this. And uh, again, I'm, I'm going to really try to condense and keep them down to about 15 minutes next time. So anyway, uh, thanks for joining me. We're going to see you uh, on lesson number two coming up. Take care. Adios. Jew and Gentile, born in Messiah, born in Yeshua, born in the olive tree. Jew and Gentile, born in Messiah.